Welcome to the Money Over 50 podcast, brought to you by Dallas Davison and Michael Hogue from Money Over 50 Financial Advisors. This information is general in nature and does not take into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. Therefore, you should consider whether the information is appropriate for you and your personal circumstances. If you require personal advice, please contact Money Over 50 Financial Advisors. Here are your hosts, Dallas Davison and Michael Hogue. Welcome to Money Over 50 with Dallas and Michael. Dallas, today uh, we're having a look at a case study for one of your clients. So um, the title of the podcast, Getting Into Position to Work Part-Time Within Two Years. So um, it's great to have a case study. We've had a lot of conceptual yep, podcasts nice recently. So, so it's good. It's, it's one of these ones that, um, that uh, we hope will resonate with a lot of our listeners. So tell us yep. about... John and Jane Smith, as, as uh, they as they are always known. Um, so the thing that will probably resonate with a lot of uh, a lot of people to give the, the the background here. So John and Jane became clients uh, of mine in August two thousand and nineteen. So a couple of years ago, just over a couple of years ago, uh, they were age fifty six at the time. Um, and the big thing about them is that they they love to travel. So that's that's a, sort of their um, their big passion in life I guess is is that they wanted to wanted to wanted to save for retirement and wanted to you know make sure that they weren't going to run out of money and that they could live a decent lifestyle throughout their retirement but they, they really wanted to also be able to to travel a fair bit and so for a lot of people who are who are looking to do a fair bit of travel leading up to or in their retirement there's there's kind of two parts to it and this is where it gets into the working part-time thing so there's obviously We've got to save enough money to, to financially fund the, the travel. But the second thing is, is, I guess, for a lot of people, if you're, if you're working full-time, you, you sometimes, you're working full-time, you've got all the income, you've got all the money, but you don't have the time to travel. Mm. And so that's that trade-off of you've got, to, you've got to sort of work enough to save enough money to be able to fund the travel, but then you've almost got to cut back on the work time to mm. be able to, to have the holidays. So. So for these guys, we, we didn't necessarily have, and, and this is, I think, the other thing that might resonate with people is they knew they wanted to get set up for retirement. They knew they wanted to travel and, and both throughout the rest of their working life in retirement. They didn't necessarily have um, concrete goals of you know, when they wanted to stop work and they didn't necessarily have concrete goals of you know when they wanted to go and do these trips. They just knew that those were, those were two kind of... Um, conflicting goals in some mm. way it's this mm. they could just focus all their energy on working full time and saving as much as possible for retirement and and just focus on that or they could um, you know work part time and just earn enough to live on and fund the travel and and sort of not not add too much to their retirement savings and so um with these guys, it's actually been um an interesting example where the the good part of COVID. so they have in the last couple of years, and I'll go through the numbers here, but they've they've really, really improved their position a lot in that couple of years, which I think for a lot of our clients have been the same boat where even if they wanted to go and do some travel, they, they couldn't. And so they've used this opportunity to to really boost their retirement savings and, and, and really get the ball rolling there with a view to being able to cut back uh, down the track. So... Um, I guess for a bit of detail, when they became clients, so again, just over two years ago, they had about $540,000 in super combined. They had $920,000 worth of uh, rental properties. So there was three rental properties in, in, in Townsville, so or probably the equivalent of one property in Sydney. But um, they also had $600,000 worth of, worth of debt against those rental properties. And they had a home loan of 260000 So they had... Uh, a net position or what we would consider retirement savings of six hundred thousand dollars and so um, yeah and and, and that in, that excludes the the principal place of residence mm -hmm. um, isn't that right Dallas so yeah. so basically um, when we look at someone's net retirement position we exclude their principal place of residence mm -hmm. because they they're not going to draw an income from that in their in their retirement mm -hmm. Um we we so we exclude it whatever it's worth. Yep. Um, we we yep. we largely disregard it. Yep. The 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 net retirement savings, if you look at the super plus the rental properties, mm. minus the debts, six hundred thousand dollars. Yep. In this case, that's a good point. And that's uh, another point there, I guess. Is that <laughs> like for these guys, they're likely going to 
they might not stay in that and that's the other thing that people might look at is, is if they were if our plan was for them to downsize in retirement we mm. might take that into account so we wouldn't necessarily consider it as retirement savings but there'll be some money to get added in there but for these guys they're, they're, what their house is worth they may well sell or move um, in, in future and go somewhere else but they're probably going to sell the house and then buy something for a similar similar amount so we've sort of got that 600,000 is their retirement savings that's what we've got to work with for now Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, they're, they're working full time, and so we're really focused on how do we make the best use of that and, and, and ramp things up. So, so for these guys, over that couple of years, I'll, I'll sort of go through what we've what we've done or the strategy that we've followed, um, and then explain where that sort of got them to. So, they, they run their income, they run their income slightly separate. Um, so they've basically got we've got um, Jane's income. Um, she maxes out her her before tax contributions to super via salary sacrifice. So um, she's on a, a relatively high wage and um, makes payroll via payroll makes contributions into into super to max out her her concessional contributions each year, uh, which is an interesting one because maybe it's interesting to us. Who knows? But. Normally, for a lot of other people, we'd recommend personal contributions to super, which we then claim as a tax deduction. The reason why I've, I've recommended the salary sacrifice for her via her payroll is is purely based on a if it's not broken, don't fix it model. So yeah. she's she has salary sacrificed uh, throughout her working life. We we just she was already doing it. It was already working. She knew how it all worked. She was comfortable with it, happy with it. We just dialed that up to to bring her up to the limit for the financial year, and I think that's. That's another part of that example where when they when people come to see us, you're not, or even if you're looking at making changes to your mm. to your financial situation, you don't want to spend any time or energy changing things for the sake of changing things. So I was going like for for her, you salary sacrificing now. That's working. You've been doing that for a long time. It's obviously sustainable. Let's just tweak that slightly, but keep that rolling along as is. So. And to be fair, it's akin to the difference between tomato and tomato. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's still the same fruit; it tastes the same. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a matter of personal preference. So what yeah. what Dallas is referring to there at the moment, she salary sacrifices, which means she claims the tax deduction yeah. every fortnight in her in her wage, effectively. Yeah, that's um, right. Our preferred method, and it's it, it's ultimately the same, is that is that instead of salary sacrificing from before tax dollars, um, our clients put the money in from after tax dollars and they claim the tax deduction at the end of the financial year yeah. in one lump sum. Yeah. Um, why it's a preferred method is that it's just a bit of another forced saving mm-hmm. and it goes towards things like travel, for yeah. example. So, yeah, so right. but, yeah. but ultimately, it's, the same. it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. That's right, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so so we max out uh, her concessional contributions. Or we and and like we say, the main thing is that it's the tomato tomato thing. Uh, you know, call it whatever you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. As, as long as you're <laughs> yeah. maxing out those concessionals, you as long as you're maxing out the amount that you can you can get into super and, and claim as a tax deduction, whether it's via payroll or via personal contributions, I don't care. Where as long as we're maxing that out, we're going to see a, a big um, a, a great result in the future. And so. The other things that we've done over the last couple of years is is we so Jane sold her so they had three properties um, two of which Jane owned and, and, and one that John owned so Jane sold her two properties for around six hundred thousand um, dollars the she paid back the debt um, kept a little bit of cash and 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 had basically had a spare two hundred thousand dollars to put into super so the reason for that and and we've touched on this uh, a heap of times in other podcasts about. We looked at, and this this happened over the course of this wasn't the week after they became a client, mm-hmm. but when they became a client, as we've touched on, we looked at here's all your assets, here's your liabilities. We went through and gave gave every line item, every everything a job, and said, right, well, the job of your superannuation fund is to grow as much as possible and to provide you that that income stream in retirement. We looked at for her, we looked at the the couple of rental properties she had. And they they weren't they weren't really doing any job for her. So so particularly because one of these properties actually had no debt against it. Mm. So she she lived in it and then paid off the debt and then moved out. And so it wasn't it wasn't really growing substantially. Um, she was she was getting minimal rent, uh, minimal capital growth over the long term. She didn't she wasn't able to to 
you know, one of the advantages of residential property is that you can borrow uh, quite mm. a bit against it and, you know, that interest becomes tacked up or a few different things like that. So it, we looked at it and it was a fairly simple one to go, what's the job of this money? Mm. And, and it was purely around, <coughs> again, the same thing. It, it was being treated in a different way. It was going in a different asset class. It was in a different um, ownership structure. It was owned in our own name. And we went, well, it doesn't really, it doesn't, it's not fit for any purpose. And mm. so what we've actually done there is we basically treated this as, as two sort of separate things. Is We wanted any money that we want to grow for retirement for the long term, we want to get that into superannuation because her, uh, so Jane's marginal tax rate is, a, is quite a bit higher. So the tax that she was paying on the return on those properties was a lot higher than, than, than the tax rate within superannuation, mm. which is 15%. Um, and she's able to get that money into super, get it working for her, pay less tax, you know, get a higher long-term return and not have to deal with it, not have to think about tenants and you know, rent and things going wrong and all the rest of it. So it was a pretty simple one when we broke it down like that, when we gave that money a job and said, what, what's the point of those things? So what we actually did there was, like I said, paid that off, uh, kept a little bit of cash aside, and that was, again, the point of that money was just as a bit of a buffer to, to have up your sleeve there. Um, and we made a lump sum contributions to super. So this was the amount that um, we we spoke about where she was she's maxing out her before tax contributions. She had the lump sum from the sale of those properties. There's no there's no um, tax to pay on that. So she could actually get that money into super as after tax contributions. Yep. And so she's been able to get that in via we actually did that in June and July of one year so that we haven't uh, haven't gone over any limits or anything mm. like that. <laughs> Another bit of an extra little one percent of there is we put that two hundred thousand dollars into a separate superannuation fund. Um, it, it's basically a tax-free um, super fund. So the reason for this is so that when that money goes to her adult kids, it will be tax-free to them. So I won't get into the weeds on that again because that's one that we've, we've recorded podcasts yeah. around that around the inheritance tax of of some superannuation funds. But that was a bit of a one percent we did as well. So for John, over the last couple of years, uh, sort of a similar strategy in as much as we wanted to max out uh, before tax contributions for him. His was a bit different because he hadn't been hadn't been making as much in, in salary sacrificing or making personal contributions. We actually had some carry forwards that we could make. So each year, we've actually made a twenty thousand dollar personal contribution into Super for him, which which would put him over his concessional contributions in that year, but but we're carrying forward unused amounts from previous years. Yep, so just explain that a little bit further. So what was going in already for yep. $20,000 to put him over? So he's he's got, he's, how much did he have from he, going in already? He, so. he's, uh, he's, I think his income is probably about $60,000 a year. And mm. He's got, he's actually making 5%, what they call standard member yeah, contributions. Yeah, sure, he's making, And 12.75%. Employer contributions yep. going in. Yep, with his. But yeah, but in in the years before they became a client, or the year before they mm. became a client, they, they, he hadn't made any contributions. And yeah. So we could we could actually catch up on or carry forward the unused amounts from that year. So we were able to make twenty thousand in that first year, and then twenty thousand again last year. Um, so what we actually did there was we, we funded that via um, we, we pulled a bit of money out of the out of the, the offset account or out in, in one case out of the offset account in one case out of the home loan redraw. So mm. this is another one of those strategies that people sometimes struggle with is you're watching your home loan go down and people really want to focus on the home loan going down. What we said is we, we definitely want the home loan coming down but if we don't make this $20,000 personal contribution this year, we're, we're going to miss out on a fairly size of the tax refund. So yeah. What we've done is we've basically pulled twenty thousand out each year, put that into super. Now, what's going to happen is when when John um, sells his investment property, when his tenant moves out, he's going to clear the debt and use the rest of it to to basically pay back the amounts redrawn from the home loan. Yeah, so it's 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 good. I mean, the, we we always talk about having an exit strategy. Yep. For for and if you have that exit strategy, you say, okay, well, yeah. well, yeah. Uh, there is an exit strategy for that. Mm. Um, we're we're really picking up, we're picking up the tax benefits now, and if we don't pick them up now, they, they, they they're, they're forever. gone forever. Yeah. Um, and what we're talking about there is is you know that twenty thousand dollars goes in, he claims back thirty four and a half percent of yep. that amount as a tax deduction. So, um, 
what's that? Nearly seven thousand dollars of of tax deduction, yeah. personal tax deduction. He gets back. Yep. Uh, as that twenty thousand dollars goes into his super fund, he loses only fifteen percent tax, which means he loses three thousand yep. dollars. It's a no brainer. Yeah. It's, it's an arbitrage. Yeah. Um, uh, and and look, even in an extreme, if you have to, yeah, you know, if you have to pull back mm-hmm. on your mortgage to do that. And in this case, Generally he did. Sense. The yeah. exit strategy could be, yeah. could also be, well, um, at retirement when he meets his preservation condition of release, yep. and is age sixty and over, he can pull that money out tax free. Yep. Uh, so if he did three years worth of that, mm. then yeah, he, yep. he can he can effectively pull that mu- yeah pull sixty thousand yeah pull some of that money out yep. and pay back the loan over that period of time, and he's picked up the tax deduction. That's exactly right, and that's a good point I think with a lot of this where we talk about you know, net position or net retirement savings. Um, most people uh, correctly want to be debt-free at retirement. Mm. So that's that's a big aim for a lot of people. Um, but th- there's more than one way to do that. So, mm. And that's that's kind of what, we, what we've looked at here is, yes, we want to get rid of that home loan. However, we can get rid of that home loan through a few different ways and, and pick up some tax savings and pick up some benefits mm. along the way. So that's what we've been doing. So... Like I said, that was two and a bit years ago. Um, so the position that they're now in, just from um, basically making those extra contributions, plus what we obviously did two years ago, as we talk about, we always do, we had a look at how this superannuation was invested and, and getting that money working as hard as possible for them. Now, they've been, you, you could say they've been, been lucky because since they became uh, clients, company prices have pretty much just gone up and to the right. Um, but that's... That's the decision that we made two years ago was based on where do we want to be in 10 years' time and in mm. 20 or 30, 40 years' time. It just so happens that in this two years, there's been a run-up in price. Well, what's interesting about that, so you were saying they became clients in August 2019 yeah. and we're now recording this in October 2021. So roughly, um, yeah, not even not even the middle, but close to the middle of that was the the thirty seven percent drop That's in point. the yeah, in yeah. COVID nineteen. Yeah. Um, now, if you ask people, yeah, would you rather have been invested throughout that time? Yeah, or would you rather been um, in uh, more conservative, low returning, yeah. stable investments? People would take the latter yes. usually. Yeah. Um, I've checked the returns over that period of time just recently, and they're certainly not any. They're not any more. Than the long term average, yep. so the yep. the uh, and I got to be careful with with rates of return because like because <laughs> it's very very different on yes. um, yep. when you're measuring over a short term period of time. But but yeah, but over that time frame, um, it, it, the last time I checked, it was in the ten to twelve percent range yep. uh, over that period of time for yeah, okay. the good quality Australian companies and and global companies. So yep. in, in superannuation phase, so yeah. certainly not not out, not not, not, not crazy, not, not no, crazy no, amounts no, over and no, above. I guess what the, you're probably right. My my point is that is is just that uh, when I say they've been lucky, or not so much been lucky, but they haven't. They they're not. Company prices aren't down now compared to where they were no. two years ago, and and I think that's the key is that. Whenever we have a new client, it's that's kind of the conversation you're having is that we're making in we're making a decision about your investment strategy based on the very long term. Now, over the next year or two, this will will either this will either be better or worse in two years' time. We mm-hmm. just don't know in advance. We only know that we can make that decision based on that long term yeah. focus. So, for these guys, it, it's worked out. And like you say, that's a good point. I hadn't even thought about it, is that that's with that thirty five percent drop during COVID, isn't mm-hmm. it? So. Um, so they now have got um, their five hundred forty thousand in super has grown to just under a million dollars. So it's it's nine hundred eighty thousand. Bearing in mind that they've <laughs> they've contributed after tax amounts of two hundred thousand plus maximised the amounts they could put in from before tax dollars. So they've got nine hundred eighty thousand in super. They've got one one property left for sort of around three hundred thousand dollars with about two hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of debt. They've got the home loan of two hundred and forty thousand dollars left. So, as we said, they they were focusing a fair bit of their cash on paying that off, but they've been redrawing that to add a bit to to super. Cash of sixty thousand dollars gives them a net position of somewhere around nine hundred thousand. So, essentially, in in two and a bit years, they've gone from net retirement savings of six hundred thousand to around nine hundred thousand mm. dollars, and. It's obviously a big jump, but I think you you make a good point there, Michael. It's not. 
it's not inconceivable. And I think that's what happens. We've touched on this before with how long it takes to make 100,000. We know how long it takes to get to 600,000. And so we extrapolate that and go getting from 600 to 700 mm. to 800, 900, it's going to take just as long as it took me to get from 300 to 400,000. Mm. Once you get once you get up beyond that half a million dollar mark, things start to tick along a lot quicker, mm. even based on average rates of return. And so they've been able to, to jump from 600 to 900 in, in a touch over two years. Mm. Now, the thing that, or I guess the way that I think of it, why this, I think their position is interesting, why I say it's it's about getting in a position for work part time within two years, is that the difference between six hundred nine hundred thousand, obviously it's three hundred thousand dollars difference, but the real difference is that they are now in a position where they can basically let the money go to work for them, and and what I mean by that is that. We've worked out they need about $2 million in retirement savings based on their, their sort of um, mm. current income needs. So in our last meeting, we had a really one of, the, one of those fun conversations we get to have when, when things have worked out exactly according to plan. So they've got two options. Either way, they can fund $30,000 per year worth of travel between now and retirement. So the first option is to work full-time until age 65. So if they were to do that, they'd actually be slightly slightly more slightly ahead of where they needed to be of that two million. Do we point out mark. how old they are now? I don't know. They're fifty eight. Yeah, fifty eight. Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're fifty eight yeah, yeah, now. now. So yep. they came to you at fifty six, yep. they're now fifty eight. Yep. yep. So if they kept doing what they're doing now, by the time they get to sixty five, they would not only would they have met their two million dollar mark, and again this is uh, you know, there's projections in this, so but they're on track to be just over their two million dollar mark. And yep. so so we've sort of looked at it and went, because they've things have worked so well for them so far, they're already in a position where they can start to look at, do we continue down this track? Do we continue working full-time until age 65? Or alternatively, do we start to cut back to part-time work mm. earlier than that? So what we worked out is if they were both to just cut back to part-time work right now, what that means is they would, they would have to work until they're age 68, mm. but, but they'd basically be... So their options now are work full time for seven years or work part time for ten years. And, yep. And so, this was exactly the position that they wanted to get into. And and again, when they came in, they didn't sit down and say to me, "We want to get in a position to work part time within two years." This was all based on conversations around what's important to you, what is it you're looking to try and achieve, what do you want the next ten years of your life to look like, what do you want your sixties, your seventies, and your eighties to look like. So, but I think these guys are a, are a great case study of. That first two years or, or getting started, if, if they were coming to me now at age 58, it's you're basically just that bit behind the eight ball. And, and so this this two years where we've been able to, to take them to is, is it really it really has kick-started things so that we're now already in a position where we can start to adjust the plan. You know, we're not we're not going, hey, you've got to keep your shoulders to the wheel for the next five years and then reassess. We're already in a position where, and they will keep working full-time, you know, at least, so I'd say the next year or two, but they're already starting. They're already in a position where they can start to think about when would we like to cut back, and you know, when do we really see ourselves as wanting to stop work completely, and you know, what travel do we want to do, and is thirty thousand dollars a year, and you know, is that going to fund the travel we want to do? All those sorts of things that they're now in a position to think about and and to take advantage of. Where two years ago it was it was just unfathomable to them. They couldn't mm. couldn't. And again, it's I find it interesting where when you're looking at numbers, we spoke about this a couple of years ago. This is all a part of the plan. This is what we had in mind. Mm. It's a very different experience to live it and to see it and to, for them to go. Oh, we, we are yeah. now where where you'd sort of said we probably would be. So it's been a, it's been a fun experience. Yeah, and and um, so a couple of things there. So just go and dive in a little bit here and just yeah. explain. Yeah. So um, they're both fifty eight now. Yep. Uh, you mentioned before they can fund thirty thousand dollars of travel yep. between now and retirement per annum. Thirty thousand yeah. dollars per annum of travel between yep. now and retirement. Yep. Um, assuming assuming they continue to work part time first, if yep. you go through that option. Yeah. Um, just explain exactly how where the money's flowing from. So where's that thirty thousand coming from, and are they still making the uh, Concessional contributions to super as well. Yeah, in, so in doing that. So, so, so they basically the 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 two options are 
they they are in a position um, that they could continue working, continue maximising their concessional contributions, and they have a spare thirty thousand dollars a year left over in, in over, their in their disposable income, in their net incomes, yeah, sure, from from wages. Yep. So I've sort of gone right over if you if you're maxing out those concessionals, you got thirty thousand dollars left over. Your your home loan is already going to be getting paid down to the point where at retire at age sixty five, we we can clear that and you will still have two point two million dollars left over at that point in time. So so yep. basically, if they would work full time, the thirty thousand dollars a year would be funded by um, just their 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 savings. Their, their from savings. Their, work. their yeah. savings. Yep. Yep. So they've done all. They've done all the the. They've done what they need to do in yep. their concessional contributions. Yep. Uh, to 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 um, fund their retirement plan. Yep. So they've got thirty thousand dollars left spare left yep. over. They can just go and yep. spend that. They don't yep. have to save that, of course. That's right. Yeah. So the part time option is essentially that they they would their income would drop sort of significantly. I mm. worked on a point six, so yeah, three days a week rather than five days a week. Mm. Um, essentially, what would happen then is that they wouldn't uh, they would live on their earned income. Mm. So that they they'd live on that they 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 spend about eighty thousand dollars a year. They yep. live on that. They'd be able to earn that and live on that. The thirty thousand dollars a year um, now it, it comes from a combination of they have a little bit left over from the eighty thousand dollars a year, mm. and they'd be able to to um, to save you know use some of that money for travel. But the remainder of that would actually just come out of um, things like the the cash that they've got tucked away there and mm. and the investment property when that sells. So it's basically <coughs> it's it's a it's a small amount each year that they would yeah. be drawing out of their retirement savings. But but that is yep. I guess the comparison is they either focus on continuing to add money into their retirement savings for the next seven mm. years, or they just let that tick along and in fact draw a small amount out of it. And they still end up yeah. in ten years' time in a position where they, they've met that they've hit that two million dollar target that they that they sort of needed to, to live yeah, on. Yeah, look, I'm I'm always amazed when I look at the results of of yeah. three extra years. Yes. Yeah. And um, and even if you're not putting yeah. money in, yeah. for those three years, if you're not pulling money out, yeah, it's huge. It makes a huge difference. Yeah. So um, you know, if they work three extra years part time, it means that they yeah. what they're drawing from their their you know, retirement savings comes essentially three years later, even yes. though they might dip into it a little bit. Yep. Um, but but gives them an extra three years of compounding. Yeah. And uh, even though they can't contribute as much to the well, they can, but yep. but but they they're sort of they're dipping into their cash and their yep. and their the invest uh, the rental property sale yep. when it comes through. They're dipping into the cash proceeds from that, so they are effectively um, they 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 depleting some assets but giving their yep. bigger pot of money yeah more more time three extra years to grow yeah. and it makes a huge difference yeah the um yeah i guess that's <coughs> excuse me the the way that you think it is you know if you look at it as as a graph they're, they're at nine hundred thousand now and so they, they either they're either trying to they're ramping that up and they're going mm. from nine hundred thousand to 2.2 million within seven years or they're yep. going from nine hundred thousand to to two million dollars within ten years. So it's yep. it's either a very steep line up to the right, or it's more of a gradual, slow increase yeah. over time. And yep. and you're right, it's that. And this is where these conversations are so interesting, is because there's no, like I say, there's no right answer here. There's no mm. there's no there's no one of these are your two options. This one's correct. It's a mm. well, how do you think that you will feel at sixty seven if you still have to get up and go to work part time? Do you actually yeah. think you'll care? Do you are you happy to continue doing that? You know, if they work full time until sixty five, we worked out that they've got a bit more money to travel in those early years mm. of retirement, so they can still go on their thirty thousand dollar a year trip, you know, at seventy two, seventy three. Whereas if mm. they work part time until sixty eight, they may not have quite the amount they need to do that. So. Mm. And we've talked about this many, many times. This is this is what I see as our, one of our big roles is that it's really just making breaking all this down into trade offs and and yeah. making it so that this is a, a very tangible, very concrete decision for them to make. Is these are your two options? This is this is the which one do you think is is what you will get the most amount of enjoyment from in in the rest of your working life and in retirement? And one thing that in particular stands out to me. Is the the love for travel so so? Of course, 
they haven't been able to travel mm. um, for 2020 and 2021, largely. They haven't been able to leave yep. Queensland, I'm assuming. Yep. Um, so they were going to spend $30,000 a year on both of those years, yep. um, which obviously adds up to $60,000 now. Mm. What, what I think about that... Um, Money is, is energy, as we've discussed before. Um, yeah. What th- that that really allows them mm. to go to part time work two years earlier. Yeah. Than they would have. So let's assume they're going to work. Yeah. You know, full. They're working full time for the moment. Yeah. And they were going to maybe cross over to part time work at some stage. Yep. They can effectively. They've already bought two years yes. worth of part time work, work because at part time work they. Yeah. They, so full time work, they have a spare thirty thousand dollars yep. spent uh, left over for travel, which they haven't been able to spend for the yep. last two years. Part time work, they're largely treading water, yep. um, uh, even though yep. they're making their contribution. So, so they've they've, they've got an extra sixty thousand yep. dollars of accumulated energy, yes, because they haven't been able to travel. Which really, if you look at it, the glass being half full, they um that that, that would allow them to move to part time forward. work yeah. uh, two years earlier than they than they originally planned. That's a great point, and and I guess I should clarify that that's also a part of the conversation that we had two years ago. Mm. You, you know, that was that was a thing of yeah. You know, if if two years ago when we had that first meeting, if they'd said, "Hey, we're really we're, we're tired. We don't we don't want to work full time anymore," that would have been the conversation. Is okay. Mm. Well, we can cut back to part-time work now, but that may mean that you can't spend as much on travel, and or, mm. or you you will have to work part-time for far longer, or you know any of those sort of things. So, yeah, it's it's not just a thing where it's it's a constant it's a constant um, thing that you're that you're discussing and run along, and that's a big part of our our, mm. our progress meetings with our clients is just <laughs> sort of going where did because we all know that. Our, our life changes and our attitudes towards things change over time. So, mm. for these guys, for now, they're quite happy still going to work full time. And that, that was that was our last conversation. Was going look because you've been forced to sort of save a bit more money over the last couple of years. You're a bit ahead of where you needed to be. You can either keep saving that energy and, and keep building up that energy, or you can consume some of that energy by by going to part time work sort of now. So. And and for now they're going to continue to just build that up because they're they're still happy you know going mm. to work full time. But it's a, I think it also, I guess from that energy point of view, we've touched on this before. Where it's a very different dynamic. Where I think it's a relief in their mind to go. If if they wait, they know that if they wake up one day and go, "Geez, I'm tired. I I don't really want to be having to go five days a week, mm. and I'd love to cut back a bit, or I'd love to you know take some long service leave, or I'd love to do something like that." It's a relief to know that you're in a position to do that. Whether you whether you choose to consume it or whether you mm. choose to keep storing it up, it's a really handy position to be in to, to know that that's that's where you are. Yeah, and explain just um, just explain for the listeners the exit strategy for the home loan. So the home loan now is still two hundred and forty thousand dollars. Yep. Um, so and is part of the plan for John to be drawing back. Twenty thousand dollars a year no, so, uh, on that as so, well. So he's, he's, uh, he's, he was only able to do that for two years, mm. um, and then he so he used up his carry forwards. Moving forward, there's there's probably I think it's about um, you know it's about fifteen thousand, so it's about twelve thousand that he can put in. Mm. Um, now, once he sells his once he sells his rental property, that will that will basically free up that cash flow. He, yep. he'll, the, the money that's going towards that property and that debt service now will go towards him him being able to make those contributions. So, yep. essentially, yeah. he he will he'll sell the property. He'll he'll pay back a bit of extra off the debt, um, and then they'll both just be making their before tax contributions to super. They'll be they'll be saving the thirty thousand dollars a year to to spend on. It's not saving if they're going to spend it every year on travel, but they their home loan will then just sort of tick along sideways so they're paying a little bit off it yep but and this is this is i think the point that you're making there is we're not really that fast on rushing through that home loan the, the key the key for these guys is we sort of have a long-term focus with their superannuation we have a short-term focus with their cash flow in terms mm. of being able to fund that travel the home loan is an intermediate goal that we go you know we're paying it down slowly over time but if if we get to age 65 or age 68 and there was still 50 grand left on it they're going to be in a position where they're super, they can they can take a lump sum out of their superannuation mm. at that point in time and and extinguish it in full yeah yep so so yeah the estimate is that there will be 
Yes, Obviously, more, some yeah. some balance yep. uh, still outstanding. Yeah. Um. Our, our, I mean, our position on that is, and, and we 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 see it quite often, and it's certainly a noble and and worthy thing to do. Mm. From <laughs> face value is to to for people to rip into their home loan. Yeah. If they still have one and, and, and look to aggressively pay it off by the time that they, they their yeah. retirement date comes along, yeah. when we look at it, um, oftentimes that's at the expense of yeah. concessional guys. contributions they could yeah. be making to superannuation. So, yeah. I mean, our thoughts are ten thousand dollars extra on your mortgage. Yeah, that's that's nice, but yeah. at today's interest rates, yeah. um, it's a low yeah it's a low interest saving. Yeah. That ten thousand dollars going into super if you're not making. Yes. Super contributions, and yep. you have that available. Um, for a lot of people, that ten thousand dollars you put in, okay, well you're claiming that at a thirty-four and a half percent or thirty-nine percent tax deduction yep. in many cases, and only paying fifteen percent on the way in. So, yep. so you, you, you're generating, um, yeah, you're generating a free money return mm. there, and and the, and and the exit strategy is that, yeah, you just take a little bit of lump sum. You take. Time. Uh, some of well, the extra lump sum that you've accumulated uh, by doing that and, and, and squash your mortgage over time. Well, and it's such a small percentage as a, uh, generally, <laughs> like for these guys. It, it is interesting because we often have people that their, their focus is on, so like for these guys, they need about $2 million in retirement savings mm. and uh, and they need their mortgage paid out. But mm. you often have people going, okay, well, we're going to pay out our home loan. Mm. Like that's important. Like you say, that's a, that's a worthy use of money. But if you got your home loan paid out, but they've only got a million dollars in retirement savings, yeah, they still can't do the things they want to do. So it's it's all going to tie in together as as part of that bigger picture plan. The other one that I'd, I'd add to that as well is the reason why I haven't sort of said you know focus on paying off the home loan is we've only we've only got so much bandwidth, you know what I mean. Mm. And so for these guys, I've sort of said the more simple we can make that plan, the easier it is to stick to. So I've said, all we need to do is we need to max out your, once you sell this other rental property, mm. we need to max out your your concessional contributions to super and anything else left over, spend it on travel. Mm. It's kind of very easy to, it's easy to save, it, it's easy to make those contributions if you go, right, we'll, we'll make the contributions and we'll, We'll keep our you know standard living costs relatively lean because whatever's left over we get we get to go and spend mm. that on travel. Mm. And I think we've talked about this before. Where my my attitude with a lot of this stuff is with goals is probably a bit different. Where I think that a six month goal is is easy to focus on, and a ten year goal is easy to focus on because ten years ten years is long enough away that you don't have to make huge lifestyle changes to get the mm. result you need. So I like to run along with a, basically a six-month plan of here's what we need to do now mm. and a 10-year goal. Of, and so for these guys, it's very concrete where you go, we just need to max out your concessional contributions. That's that's the 10-year thing taken care of, or seven-year thing taken care of. Mm. And anything else that you need to, you need to save the money that you want to go on the travel with. So as long as you're, as long as you're not pulling money back off the home loan to go and travel and as long as you're not spending any of your other retirement savings, you know, Fill your boot, basically, mm. and and it's a yeah, it, it's it's funny because I, I think people often overestimate their ability to be disciplined about these things. Like if you've mm. got a two hundred and forty thousand dollar home loan, and you go, we're going to we're going to do it all. We're going to max out our concessional contributions, and we're going to pay our home loan down within four years, and we're mm. going to pay for these overseas trips, and we're going to you know, it's it's you, your your attention just gets unfocused and it gets split across too many different things and so i like to make it as as simple and concrete as possible this is all we need you to do for the next mm. six months go and do that and then come back and we'll reassess yep uh that was good that was good a nice easy one for you mate yes. uh that was yeah no it was very interesting so um it's always interesting to see uh i have clients that are similar but different so everyone's scenario is different so it's yeah. good to see it's good to see some of um of your client examples in, in action. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Money Over 50 podcast with Money Over 50 Financial Advisors. We look forward to catching up again soon.